Hey, it's Guy Raz here, and welcome to The Great Creators. This is where I have conversations with some of the most incredible actors, musicians, and performers of our time. And my guest today, the multi-talented Ben Platt. You might know Ben Platt from Dear Evan Hansen or Pitch Perfect. He's also released three studio albums, including his latest, Honey Mind. Ben's only 30 years old, but he's just one Oscar away from an EGOT. So let's jump into Ben's creative journey. We'll learn about how he helped develop the character Evan Hansen, how he deals with anxiety, and how his relationship with his fiance helped to inspire his new record. Here's Ben Platt. Tell me about your family growing up, because I think there were five children in your family. Yes, I'm one of five, number four out of five. Um, and we all grow up singing and doing musical theater in like a, uh, the same youth program. Uh, and um, very much that was our kind of shared love language was show tunes and music and... All, f- all five kids. Oh, yeah. I mean, you, you know, only my brothers and I have sort of pursued it in any kind of real way, but my sisters too have wonderful voices and grew up singing and doing a cappella and choir and theater and we all kind of made our our uh, like social group circles very much out of the arts kids. T- tell me how this was like, how this was manifested. Cause there's like, there's different um, archetypes. There's the Von Trapp family where, you know, the kids are, uh, but then there's just families that just love theater or the kids sing together spontaneously, or it's also encouraged by par- by the parents to, you know, to pursue this thing. So how did it like, I mean, yeah, I mean, just curious. Would you guys sing at home? Were you, were you from a very early age, kind of just got really interested in being in community theater? Like, how how did it happen? It just sort of became the the, the our our shared language. My parents met doing theater in college, and they both have mm. were singers too. And you know, in the car, we would listen to cast albums and not necessarily the radio. And it just sort of became like the games we would play would be about you know, song titles and lyrics and show tunes. And we would sing like a, together at uh, any kind of family function. So like at bar mitzvahs and weddings and stuff, we often would sing a song as a family or, you know, a sort of parody song for whoever's being bar mitzvah or wed. And that tradition continues. And, you know, we all again went to this program. And so it wasn't necessarily, they certainly were not encouraging of us going into the business in the sense that yeah. my dad obviously has a very clear idea of how difficult and, um, sort of, you know, uh, sacrificial, like emotionally it can be. So I don't think they ever would encourage us if we could imagine ourselves doing anything else to do that. But once I sort of separated myself out and started to realize that my affinity for it really went along with my passion and love for it and that it was actually something that defined me in a deeper way, they were all, they were definitely, you know, wildly supportive and they saw what it did for me sort of internally. I, I was talking to a, a 14-year-old kid that I know who's a theater kid, and uh, I mentioned that I said, oh, tomorrow I'm going to be doing this interview with Ben Platt, and his eyes lit up. And for him, you know, Dear Evan Hansen, Hamilton, are those were the, the musicals that just brought him in, reeled him in. What, what, was, the, what was the first one that did it for you? What was, what was the musical that reeled you in? It's a great question. In terms of like when I was... A- a, a, a really small child, uh, The Wizard of Oz is what I would watch when I got home from school every day. And I had a real fascination with Dorothy and with the, the sort of fantasy world of it all and with Judy Garland. And, you know, that was very much as much of a theater, kind of musical theater awakening as it was like a queer awakening, I think. But I think in terms of an actual onstage musical that kind of was a turning point, I think, you know, when I was maybe a little older, like 10, 11, 12, I discovered... Uh, the Sunday in the Park with George, um, like pro shot that exists, the PBS one with Bernadette and Mandy and the original cast. And I think obviously Sondheim is big in my house, but that that show in particular, A, the role of George and just Mandy's performance and this like 360 kind of, the thing that this like art form lends itself to, which is like getting to see the inside of a character that is otherwise quite thorny and abrasive and that you don't really get to know until you hear what their like sort of musical soul sounds like. I think I was really moved by the character and then also just the sophistication of the whole thing and also the kind of messaging of particularly Sunday in the Park with George, which is about like the ways in which we sacrifice our well-being or our personal relationships to be artists and like what it means to live 
somewhat in your work and in your head all the time. And I think as a kid, I very instinctually felt that way and felt a little bit introspective all the time. And performing is where I felt like I could really externalize everything and connect. And that show really emblem, uh, just was like emblematic of that. And I think I, I, I just fell in love. And, and, and at home and on car trips, like that was what was played. Oh yeah. I mean, th not that, but, but just music. Totally. So, Sunny in the Park, a lot of song time, Into the Woods, Gypsy, Thoroughly Modern Millie, Oliver, you know, you name it. Um, you, I mean, you've had, I, I mean, you're so young, but so experienced because you, you started out as a professional very young. I mean, nine years old. I'm going to ask you about that in a moment, but were you, I mean, I, you know, of course, you know, there was, it sounds like you had, there was all this energy in the house around singing and around performing, but it must have been driven by you. I mean, to be nine years old and to say, I want to be in a, a show. Do you remember where that impulse came from and, and, and how it came? Uh, sort of. I mean, I, I, I think definitely, you know, being born into a family where, I was exposed to musical theater and to the business and stuff is, was like a huge privilege for someone who that is so innate to. And I think I, I, I knew that it was, it was like a joyful thing that I enjoyed, you know, engaging in with my siblings and my friends. But I think around that age, I started to realize kind of what I was touching on, which is just that I didn't really feel entirely myself elsewhere. Like I didn't feel totally turned on, like, 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 a you know, like, like activated, um, Un unless I was, you know, in rehearsal or performing or singing or I started taking voice lessons, et cetera. And I just think that it was very clear to me subconsciously or as much as it can be consciously when you're that young. And certainly to my parents watching me sort of come alive in that way, that like this was really where I belonged and what I wanted to do. And on top of that, you know, again, because I was born, you know, with a father who really understands this whole thing, 360, he was not going to humor me, you know, if I didn't have the ability to to back up, you know, what my passion and desire to do it. And so I think when all those things came together and it, you know, became clear that this could really be a realistic path, I think that that's when they were are willing to let me go in and audition for some professional stuff. Your dad, Mark, was a theater or is a theater and film and TV producer. And he had done things like Into the Woods and, and been involved in, you know, Legally Blonde and all these things. So essentially what you're saying is like, if you weren't good, he 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 knew. I mean, yeah. he would have been like, he couldn't lie. <laughs> you know, maybe he would, he would say to your mom, like, you know, maybe we should d discourage Ben from trying out because, you know, this is fun. But 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 clearly, like, they encouraged us. You were nine years old. You got you you auditioned for a part um, in a in in the Music Man for at the Hollywood Bowl with with Kristen Chenoweth. You got the the part of Winthrop, uh, the famously played by Ron Howard. Yes, in the in the movie. Um, uh, and you know the the look of the lisp. That's I mean, t tell me about that. I mean, that's a pretty big role, and you're in the Hollywood Bowl. What t ten, fifteen thousand people? Yeah, in that theater. I mean, I re I recently got to play my own music there on my last tour, and and you know headline it myself, and that was sort of a wild kind of at the Hollywood Bowl. Yes, yeah. that was sort of a, a kind of a crazy full circle feeling of having some memory of performing there as a kid, but. You know, I think I my my memories of it are all just feeling incredibly like alive and present. Like I think I just loved every moment of it and I I think I was much less daunted by like the size or the stakes than I think maybe I would expect to be given sort of my disposition elsewhere. I think that's always been sort of the crux of why I continue to want to do this is just that I uh feel like there's such a beautiful safety in like the controlled chaos of performing live. And so I think as a kid, I loved that I knew exactly what was expected of me and that I really felt like I could deliver it and that um, I was treated like an adult, like a professional and um, really like a lot was expected of me. And I think I really liked rising to that occasion. And I just loved the, immediately loved the like community family connection that comes with theater and how everybody becomes close and gets to know each other and you keep these connections. You like collect friends throughout all these different families that you make. Um, and as a kid who was obviously still figuring out that he was queer, et cetera. And, you know, I, it was really helpful in, in sort of helping me learn how to connect to people and make friends based on what we both like shared as like a common passion. And um, I just remember loving it. 
Yeah, I just I, I, I just read and I can't remember um, the researcher who wrote the piece, but but there's research looking into into what builds connections, genuine connections between people. Um, and what they found near the top of the list is when people sing and dance together regularly. And I and it was a kind of revelatory because I thought, is this was it in church, like or or you know, in a religious setting? But no, it was just singing or dancing together. And I thought, do and I and this is a great question for you because I was like, do companies in in a musical theater do they get close? Do they get really tight? Absolutely. I mean, I think you're that that study doesn't surprise me at all because you're really jumping off of a cliff when you're doing those things and. Not only is it like a catharsis and a release, and that's also allows you to open up to connection, but it's also scary. You're like jumping off of a ledge and really putting yourself out there. And the only people that are with you or that you're trusting enough to do it are the ones who are also jumping off that same cliff. So certainly, you know, it's. I think a lesson that I learned since I've been working now for over two decades is like, when, I, when you're a kid and you be, you make these, you forge these connections, you're like, well, I'm going to stay friends with all 33 people in this company for the rest <laughs> of my life because we've, you right. know, we've created this amazing thing together. But uh, obviously, just by virtue of like, you know, growing and becoming an adult, you, you won't usually take, a, you know, a couple people with you into your real life. But while you're making something, I think it's impossible not to feel close and, and, and unbelievably dependent on the people doing it with you just because no one else is experiencing it the way that you all are. And I don't think I've ever seen a seen or been part of a great piece of theater where that connection didn't exist. I don't think it's possible without it. So I I certainly think that that's a really quick and easy way to get close to people. And that's why my best friends are still my, you know, high school theater friends, because that's, those are the places where you're being the most vulnerable and, you know, taking the most risk and those bonds don't go away. You mentioned this idea of feeling activated, like alive when you are on stage. And and of course, as a kid, as a 9, 10, 11 year old, you couldn't consciously go through that thought process. You're not sophisticated enough to recognize Certainly. that. It's, it, it happens with reflection. But when you started, because this nine years old, you're in the music man, and this begins now, you know, a, a career. This would continue through through your teenage years, high school, and then obviously to the, to the present. But a career where you began to hone the craft mm -hmm. and you're still going to get better at it because you're so young you're still working at it um but what do you remember about being you know 10 11 you were in a play in a, a, a national play at 11 caroline uh caroline or change i think it was called mm -hmm. what do you what do you remember about working to get better as an actor on stage because it you know very it's very rare for a nine-year-old to you know that's why there's so few young, young, young actors. It's just hard. It's hard to be good totally. when you're so young, right? So what do you remember about trying to get good at this thing? You know, I think, especially in like film and television, a lot of times great kids or, 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 or great performances from kids are about just capturing them as they are and, and being able to yeah. get something organic and not have them realize that they're doing something. And <laughs> right, I think right. in the theater, that's just not possible because you're having to figure out how to sustain it and do it repeatedly. And there's so much technique involved. Live. Live, exactly. So... I think I remember, particularly as you mentioned, Carolina Change was such a turning point because it was a the, the sort of beefiest role I'd been given to that point. It was you know the second lead in the musical, and he's there's is one of the central relationships, and there's a lot of melancholy. You were eleven. I was eleven, yes, and there was a lot of you know dissonant music and melancholy subject matter and and complicated emotional subtext, etc. And you know George Wolf, George C. Wolf, who directed it, I think is one of the first truly great teachers that I had because I just recall you know, him helping me to make that transition and that turning point of taking control of what I was doing and not just coming in, showing up and knowing that, you know, I'm going to be able to, to deliver, you know, vocally and in terms of learning my blocking and, you know, the things that are, as a kid, you know, a lot of, that gets a lot of the job done, especially in certain roles, like in sweeter things like The Music Man or a little bit more simple characters. And I think it was the first time that I was asked to think about my own life or to bring in emotions that I was feeling as a person, you know, internally or to, you know, any kind of like acting exercise or scene work or just really getting in the weeds for the first time with him. And he's such a brilliant, brilliant director and collaborator. Um, and I think that was the first time where I started to sort of take pride in like uh, really trying to get better and learning and, and being an active participant in, you know, giving a consistent performance and a good nuanced performance. Did that begin to kind of inform how you would eventually approach all your 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 roles as as if you are 
embodying that character, you're becoming that person. Definitely. I mean, I think what I've learned over the couple of decades is definitely that no two processes are the same. And I think anytime I've tried to come in with a kind of plan or like a preconceived notion of how I'm going to attack something, there's always something slightly different about the particular piece or the character that doesn't necessarily jive with that. So I try to just take it one thing at a time. Obviously, there are things that are mainstays and routines, like the way you get your voice back in shape and, you know, the, the physical technical stuff. But, you know, Evan Hansen, for example, I workshopped and did readings of for many years and, you know, helped to sort of create the character with the writers and, and sort of from scratch. And so that was a process of finding as we went and, you know, listening to instincts and, you know, letting physicalization start to happen over a long period of time and and slowly shape this guy as opposed to like Book of Mormon, which is a show that I came into that was already created and someone else had originated the role and I was having to come into a track that was already very predetermined and figure out what are the ways I can make it my own and what are the ways in which I need to just add to this formula that's already working. Um, and so it's really sort of dependent on the piece, uh, but de generally always the physical manifestation and the kind of body connection and getting things in your body and feeling what it feels like as opposed to how, you know, just, just the difference between my sort of mm -hmm. casual state and whatever the character sort of physically feels like has always just been my jumping off point. You know, you might not be able to answer this question right away, but I'm curious if you have a perspective on it, which is, you know, like in, I mean, it's not a great analogy, but like in a yoga practice, or for example, like you're you're often told breathe through it, you know, just just let go, let your muscles stretch and relax, and it's it's sort of imagine there there's a point when you are evolving as an actor where you you begin to learn to let it go, right? To, yes. It's using a a cliche to just let it go and to become to stop acting. Yes, right. Is that it's, how how does that how does that happen? How do you start to do that? I, I think it's, for, or at least for me, I can speak for myself. It's all about like doing as much preparation and work and technical, you know, rehearsing, like get, getting your body and your voice and your, just everything that can be conscious done before it's time to start performing. Just get it, get that stuff it, down. Exactly. So, and yeah. so the mm -hmm. whole point is that to ingrain it so deeply that when it's time to actually get out there and perform, you can throw it all completely away and know that it will be there and that the foundation is there and you don't need to be consciously muscling. You can, I mean, anyone can feel in an audience when there's a performance that's being sort of muscled through or like deeply controlled in a way that feels disingenuous. And I think, you know, as much technique and great choices about your posture and your, you know, physical tics and the way you're going to speak and your accent and your dialect and all these things are great, but I think it, it, they are sort of, it has to sort of be greater than the sum of its parts in the sense that once those are all part of the tapestry, I think it's about first and foremost is living as presently in the moment as possible and responding to what's happening and allowing it to sh shift and shape depending on the night and the energy and the scene partner, et cetera, and not being so rigid in, in your preparation that you're not open to the universe in that way. So I think getting a nice blanket of preparation and so that you can just sort of cast it off has been what's worked best for me. How do you work through the desire to be perfect? Because I, I've read that you, you know, we'll, we'll talk about this later, but with Evan Hansen, for example, you said, and I, I totally understand this impulse. Every night or sometimes twice a day you're going out, that's the first and only time most of the people in the theater are going to see that. And they, and you you need them to, you want them to walk away feeling like that was amazing. And that's a lot because that's like, uh, you have to have, you have to be batting a hundred, a thousand, <laughs> sorry, right? You've got to be hitting out of the park every night. And so how do you balance that desire to be perfect or close to perfect, but also with that ability to to, to feel like it's effortless on stage? I mean, I think it's def certainly an ongoing thing that I still try to figure out. I certainly, and it you know extends to even when I do concerts sort of as myself in my own music. I think for me, it's been about, Two things. It's A, just really trying to sift between the things that I can control and the things that I can't control. So, you know, I can work hard to stay healthy and warm up properly and be, you know, give 100% of myself energetically and emotionally every time. And there are things that it behooves me as like someone who has this opportunity to deliver every time that are in my control. 
But you also have to learn the things that are not in your control, which is like maybe there's a two o'clock audience that's not as high energy and maybe there's the automation and the show is going to break and there's going to be a hiccup in the rhythm or maybe, you know, you're going to have some phlegm because of allergy season and you won't be able to hit notes quite as clearly as you like. There are certain things that like no matter what you do, we're, they're human and they're going to, you know, affect your performance. And I think the first thing for me to learn has been just letting those things happen and accepting that like that there's nothing I can do and trying to mm. force my way around them is uh, just like wasted energy. And then also keeping in mind that like, I'm the only one experiencing these things repeatedly. I'm the only one that's at every show, experiencing every show in my own body. So to me, the difference between show A and show B can feel so vast because like something, a scene wasn't as crackling or I didn't feel that it was delivering emotionally the way it did yesterday or whatever it may be. And to an audience member, as you said, who's coming for the one and only time, that 99.9% .9 of the time they don't, have any clue that there's anything different going on or that it isn't like this every night or that this isn't the hundred percent show in your mind. And so I think releasing that everything show needs to feel kind of the exact same result or like emotional outcome uh, is really helpful in not trying to like, you know, overexert. Yeah. Um, let me, let me go back to your, your timeline for a moment. You graduated high school, I think in 2011 mm -hmm. in LA and, um, but, it, but I mean, the next year you were cast in Pitch Perfect. I imagine that you were, it was clear, at least in your mind, and maybe the people around you, that you were going to pursue this career. Like, I mean, this, I know you you, you applied to Columbia University, but it, it sounds like you knew that this was your path, acting. 100%. I mean, I think very shortly after I started working in like 9, 10, 11 years old, I, there was no point at which my blinders ever went down in terms of that's what I really wanted to do. I think obviously it expanded in terms of like film and TV and eventually getting to, you know, write my own music and, and express my perspective, but specifically musical theater and performing and singing, there was never any question in my mind as I became a teenager and, and a pseudo adult that that was not my focus. It's definitely been the driving force in my life the whole time. And I think, you know, I, a Pitch Perfect was a wonderful experience and I didn't necessarily know that it would afford me the opportunity to then continue and and can you know the book of mormon would come from that etc so i i applied to columbia and actually went after i shot pitch perfect because you know my parents weren't weren't open to me just kind of existing in this ambiguous um space without work and they said you know if if a job comes along that's a great job we'll have the discussion but until that time you need to go to college and obviously i was like well great i'll go be in new york city where i can do both things and so i right. went for seven weeks um and managed to do one production of hair and join an acapella group for a month and and then of course was cousin book of mormon and so i left um but i think you know i always had in my mind a hope that it would just i would just keep uh you know climbing and, and working how did you and i wonder whether it helped you that you started so early um, because getting up on a stage, like I read something that you said somewhere, which is, and I've, I've encountered this with a lot of performers, which is, and there's actually a documentary about Joan Baez, and she says a version of this, which is, I can easily stand in front of five, ten thousand 10,000 people and sing, but to have a conversation with one person is really hard. Um, maybe that's not how it is for you, but was it, has it always been easy for you to stand up in front of thousands of people and sing? Yes. I mean, I, I think the short answer is yes. I, I I do resonate with that statement in the sense that, you know, since finding my partner, Noah, and, you know, my fiance, and, and he, you know, he's really expert communicator, and he's very unafraid of conflict. He's more, he's more extroverted and outgoing. Yes, and, and can really be very direct and, and attack uncomfortable conversations and really get at things. And that was so not yeah. my that's not my strength and he has helped me so much in that arena. But, you know, I, it's certainly I think the place where I felt the strangely the safest and most kind of at home was is in front of a large group of people just because I I think, I don't know, I, 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 I any time that what's, what's expected of me is clear or what, what I, that I feel that I can really deliver or that it's within my ability to do. And on top of that, it's something I really enjoy doing. It's like, um, it, it's, um, it's just the greatest feeling and there's an, an, a feeling of comfortability that comes along with that. And the excitement and the adrenaline and the nerves that come with live performance and the, and the stakes of, you know, people coming and paying money to see you, I think feels like a really safe sort of danger in the sense that it's like, hmm. 
I, there's definitely like a theme of controlled chaos in my life in the sense that I really like to experience, you know, recklessness and, and release and catharsis and, and excitement in the context of something that's somewhat controlled or that there's a little bit of an expectation at least. Um, and I think it just is a really nice environment for me to be able to like let my guard down and feel comfortable. And I know that's so not the case for everybody, but for me, it's like where I've definitely felt the most um, like I can, I can sort of be transparent. Yeah. I mean, it's interesting because a lot of people who perform are introverted actually. Yes. You know, right They're They're actually m much more comfortable and strangely enough, very comfortable on stage it, because it's, it's a different relationship with, with people. Yeah. You know, you're, you're, you're connecting with them at a, at a different level. Yeah. There's like a suspension of disbelief or like there's this, you know, this sort of agreed upon dynamic that just doesn't exist anywhere else. It's why like theater and live performance is so untouchable in the sense that as things develop and technology and yada yada culture and film and things really morph and change, but the experience of like sitting in a room and lights going down and like the kind of electricity that creates and the sort of understood behavior that comes along with that. It just, it creates a really special, as you said, relationship that I don't think exists anywhere else. You know, I, I wonder about, um, you know, a, a, about something completely sort of off topic because you mentioned your, your parents and their support and love and all these things. And I read that, you know, from a time, the time you were, you know, a kid, 13, 14 years old, you knew that you were gay, mm -hmm. a gay man, a, a young man, and were open about it. And presumably they were loving and supportive of you. Very. I mean, I, that they, um, yeah, I told, I was on a trip on like a class trip when I was 12 or 13. And I remember I was already starting to sort of realize it myself and sharing it with a couple of friends. And there was some instance where it came up uh, and sort of cut, our chaperone caught wind of it because somebody was making some sort of comment about my being able to be close with all the girls and them allowing me to hang out with them because I was gay, et cetera. Essentially something that was perceived as like a bullying incident, which really was not. It was just me sharing. Um, and so I knew that my parents were going to catch wind of it and I and I sort of called them to get ahead of it and and uh, and tell them myself. And as soon as I got on the phone and they sort of heard my tone of voice, it was very clear to them what was happening. And they both essentially expressed that they already knew and that it hadn't, you know, been much of a surprise to anyone. I mean, when you grow up doing musical theater and sort of dressing like Dorothy from the Wizard of Oz all the time, it's like, you know, you're going <laughs> to, you're going to see it coming. Um, but they couldn't have been more accepting and, and wonderful. And I, it's a huge privilege. And I think I try to make good on that privilege by in all facets of my career, but particularly my own music and my own storytelling, just keeping it as authentically and specifically queer as I can. Um, because I think there's a lot of great queer art that's a lot of very wrapped up in important things like trauma and depression mm -hmm. and, you know, otherness and, you know, things that are part of the history for sure and that shouldn't be ignored. But I also think it's important to see just like joyful, complex human queer relationships. And so that's what I have to offer just because that's my experience. And so I think what I have to contribute is just trying to be as totally transparent about that as possible. Thanks to them not making me feel like I needed to be otherwise. Um, there, people who who follow the story of Dear Evan Hansen will know the outlines of the story, but but basically, which is that you you started to kind of do early read throughs for for um, Benj Pasek and and Justin Paul mm -hmm. and and Stephen Levinson, the playwright, um, in 2014 as just kind of workshopping it. Not no guarantee that you were going. to, I mean, the people who workshopped Hamilton didn't. Many of them didn't end up in Hamilton, right? right? It's just something you did. You had met them. Uh, Pascal and Paul a couple years earlier for something I think you auditioned for and you did not you didn't get that role you weren't the right fit at the time yes. but they said hey keep in touch with us or something like that yes right? so I had auditioned for both Michael Greif the director and Benjamin Justin the songwriters for two different things for Michael I auditioned for the tour of Next to Normal which is a brilliant musical that he directed that I was too young for and didn't get um, and then I also auditioned for Dogfight which was a musical that Benjamin Justin did before Evan Hansen that I love it's a beautiful show and again, I was I didn't get the role, but in both cases, they were great auditions, and they're lovely guys. And they, you know, I, they reached out to me on social media and said, "This this didn't make sense, this, you know, for this one, but we we loved your audition, and we're gonna keep mm -hmm. you in our heads." And that's always a nice thing to hear, but I don't think you ever really expect is gonna anything's gonna come no. from that. Um, and then they came to see Book of Mormon when I was in the show, um, 
on Broadway. Um, and afterward, um, you know, I got to talking to them and they said, you know, we do have this project that we've been keeping you in mind for and sort of seeing you in this show and combined with what we've seen from you in your audition, I, we would love for you to come in and read the role and just see how it goes. And so I came and did the very first reading where the, the first time it was ever essentially opened up and said aloud, um, which was just like a tiny rehearsal room around a table for a couple of days. And um, some of the people who were there in that reading went all the way through, as you said, and some did not. And I think for me, it was just an, Im an immediate connection of, you know, Stephen Levinson, who's a brilliant writer, his rhythm and his comedy really matching up well with the way that I like to perform and my range and style of singing really matched up with Benjamin Justin's range and style of singing. And it just all was a really synergistic thing. And I think the character and I really made sense together. Um, and so they kept me on board and we did several readings and several workshops and a production in Washington, a production off Broadway, and then finally did it on Broadway. So it was a, sort of a four year journey. I remember when it premiered in Washington, I was living there at the time. I think it was at arena stage mm -hmm. um, in 2015. And um, you, I mean, the the re reaction and critics, you know, critics. I don't think critics' reactions matter all that much, but it is something worth considering. And the and the reaction from critics was like, this guy really embody like this character is he really you know the cadence the 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 voice the way he becomes his character is so convincing. Um, and and I'm I'm wondering, even before you are were on stage premiering that show mm -hmm. and you're working through it because you were part of the process from you know the workshop. Yes. How were you able to to kind of shape the character as well? I mean, it had been written and the songs have been written, but clearly you had to help shape it as well. Yes. Um, you know, I think that. It was a, an amalgam of things. I, as I said, the, the fact that there was such a long runway and that I had the opportunity to spend so much time with it as like a, a piece of uh, writing in terms of like sitting around the table and doing book work and then having the experience of standing at music stands and doing it with a bit of physicalization and then blocking certain sequences for workshops. Just there was such a natural, real progression of letting the character like slowly come to life uh, and just in letting instincts start to speak and f feeling what the Stevens rhythm made me feel like. And a lot of it came from the page and, and it was, he was so vividly uh, realized. And I think it uh, like the, his rhythm of speech to me felt like there was such a clear connection between that and how that person might carry themselves and stand and uh, what his mannerisms might be. And also I think anxiety was a real point of, connection for me because that's something I deal with and have always dealt with in my life. And so I think yeah. the idea of like manifesting that uh, in a way that was slightly more acute and, and younger than where I was and what that might look like to someone who maybe doesn't have some of the faculties that I have to deal with it, I think was a, was a, a huge uh, help in sort of envisioning what he would be like. Um, and clothes. I, I always find that clothes and, and the cast and anything physical really just immediately informs like the way you carry yourself and move through the world and how others perceive you. And I always find that's helpful. Did, did you, were you, did you anticipate how that, how big that show would become and how, how just the, the reaction to no, it? No, I mean, I, not at all. I don't think that I truly don't, don't think you can ever expect something like that. I mean, I knew I loved it. I mean, I love musical theater and especially when it's like complicated, emotional, complex adult musical theater not to say it's not for young people of course but just in terms of it takes its characters really seriously and is trying to use the form of musical theater to do something that the story couldn't otherwise do in another form so I, I loved it and felt so grateful to be in it I think di I did not know that commercially it was going to connect in the way that it did because it's you know it's a really difficult hero who does really morally ambiguous things and it, yeah. it is not based on a film or any kind of big big IP and it wasn't like a yeah. feel good musical. It didn't have like necessarily the ingredients of like a big hit. Um, and I just think by virtue of, you know, the mental health conversation and the extraordinary score and the, you know, Stephen's book, and it just had the ingredients to really connect to people. And as soon as we started performing in DC, it was um, just so emotionally connective in a way that I hadn't experienced in musical in a long time in terms of people's reaction and crying and really starting to share their personal stories and, and they're, you know, they're, they're most just, it really was penetrating in a way that you don't often see. And I think I felt that was the first time I felt like, oh, this could really be 
something. But still then, you never know. So it just, until we were on Broadway and it was as culturally impactful as it was, I don't think I was ever counting chickens. Um, I, I read that, at, you know, during that time, I mean, it was relentless because you were, you, you basically, it was two years of your life, right? Mm-hmm. Doing that role. And, and at times, I mean, it was like you could not get off the hamster wheel. It was, and, and so you actually didn't, you know, you, you mentioned this idea that you didn't really take care of yourself. You couldn't. You ha- I mean, you had to physically take care of it, but you didn't take care of your sort of emotional needs. And and there's something you read, I read that you said, which was, I don't think anything can be genuinely fulfilling or powerful if it's not taking some kind of toll. Yeah. Can you, can you tell me more about that idea? You know, I think uh, certainly it doesn't always have to be to the intense extent of that experience and that character, but I think you know, the part of what I love about theater in particular is just that it requires that you give of yourself so routinely and so fully because you are having to experience the the thing in its entirety every night. And there's nothing is nothing is like uh, earned. It's it, it's you're starting from a blank slate every single night. Unlike a film where you can sort of rail against something for a certain amount of period of time and throw everything at the wall that you can, and then you have to kind of release it and let it go, and it gets shaped and you know, put together and then gets to exist in perpetuity without your having to re-summon it. Um, so I think the reason theater feels so deeply fulfilling and and just kind of satisfying is because it's you're so having to work from A to B to C every single time. And I, th- I just love the purity of that. And I think part of when something feeling, at least for me, like deeply satisfactory or that I feel like I've really given of myself is you know, usually involves some kind of sacrifice. Like even when I tour now, I mean, obviously as I've gotten older, I've learned how to have a little bit of a better balance of taking care of my emotional and mental health and, you know, not necessarily throwing myself, you know, uh, down the well in the way that I was able to at such a young age. But, you know, when you're, when I'm touring and, and singing as I'm about to do all summer, like you, you, you have to be in a different mindset in terms of prioritizing you know, your voice and your body and your health and not necessarily engaging in relationships the way that you normally can or going and being part of things the way that you normally can. And it's just, I think there has to be some level of of sacrifice if you're going to really accomplish something, particularly when it comes to, you know, consistently performing and delivering a performance. Do you feel like you are at your best creatively when in some way you are suffering it's, it's <laughs> it is a it's i don't know i mean I, this is a cliche but but i wonder whether you feel like you you do your best work or you think most creatively when when there's some kind of sacrifice involved yes and no i mean i don't necessarily think it has to be uh there has to be like a, a painful quality like i don't I, like obviously it's wonderful to write songs when i'm feeling heartbreak or going through something difficult, I find that that's a very fruitful place to make art from. But I also think that, you know, when it, as it pertains to this album, Honey Mine, that I'm about to release, like that there's a lot of joy and it's a lot about my relationship with Noah and, and a lot of sort of arrival points that I feel as an adult that I get to really revel in and, 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 and celebrate. And I don't think that that makes it any less satisfactory or that I, 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 I'm not happy with the work. I, I think the common denominator is just sacrifice as it pertains to really focusing and giving of yourself mentally, physically, emotionally, just being very present for it and prioritizing it and um, giving it your all and not being passive about, you know, your, your health or your technique or your energy or your, you know, ideas or your conceptualizing or your writing, whatever it may be. I think that it, for me, yes, I, I think that I, I feel the most satisfied and feel that I do the best work when I can really put a finger on how much I'm, kind of giving of myself to something. I'm curious about your music that you you start, you released your first record in 2019, I think. Mm-hmm. Um, and now you've released your third record. Um, tell me about, I mean, it, it's a natural fit. I mean, you sing, you have a beautiful voice, you're a singer. Was there, um, did anybody sort of encourage you to kind of stay in your lane? Like, hey, f- keep focusing on like, you know, like Kristen Chenoweth puts out records, but a lot of people want to see her perform songs from her plays, right? Was there that kind of, you know, people encouraging you to go in that direction? 
not necessarily people like in my corner telling me that it that I shouldn't expand. I think I think it's more so just like as you're saying, like a very much an industry norm and like a yeah, you know, so something that's difficult, which is that people see you a certain way and want a certain thing from you, and it's not always what you want for yourself. And as as wonderful as you know these three records have been, and I've been able to play great shows and you know have 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 a certain amount of success. Like I do, still feel the challenge of like it feeling somewhat secondary to other perceptions of me or other things that people are wanting me to sing or do. And I just think for me, it it came from much more of a place of like, particularly after Evan Hansen, and as we've been talking about investing so deeply in someone else's mind and, and, and becoming so synonymous with an, someone else's message and someone else's character, I think I felt such a visceral desire and need to express my own feelings and thoughts and perspective and get it back in touch with myself and sing, reclaim this, you know, this, the joy of, of singing and performing purely as myself. And, um, I think it ended up being such a wonderful channel and thing that really felt natural to me, particularly this sort of songwriting element of it. And I think has helped me to appreciate even more of the other things that I'm able to do and characters that I'm able to play because, you know, w when you spend a lot of time in someone else's work, if you, you're so craving, that, that extra level of connection that you get from just being yourself. And then when you do a certain amount of that and, you know, write all of these experiences and share them and sort of make yourself vulnerable in that way, it's such a beautiful relief and comfort to then go back into something where you can be focused more on creating a character, being part of someone's larger vision and, you know, doing something like parade, et cetera. So I just feel really lucky that I'm afforded the opportunity to do multiple things. And sometimes in terms of perception and like industry, <clears throat> the way things work, the, it, it can take away from individual lanes when you're trying to have multiple like open. Um, but I guess to me, that's so worth, you know, having the opportunity to try my hand at everything that I'm passionate about. That doing that, writing music, writing lyrics, actually forces a certain a, a level of vulnerability that is going to make you better at the other things you're doing essentially 100 percent, and also creates professional challenges for the other things that you're doing so it has to really feel worth it i, I guess because when you start to share yourself and be so you know you, it requires so much self-promotion and you know self-drive to be like your own artist and sharing your own perspective and so that sometimes makes it harder for people to be able to you know, allow you to then go back and disguise yourself and disappear and become other characters and see you in other lights and let go of some of that information, that perception in order for you to be able to do things as an actor. And, you know, it, it, it there's, you have to really, you know, care enough about having that outlet artistically to, to make it worth it. And I, I certainly have found that I do. Do you, do you feel like, like you work at your, you perform at your best when there are multiple things happening at the same time. The the record, um, I mean, you you had a show on Netflix, Politician, but you mentioned Parade, which was this the show that you did on Broadway about uh, Leo Frank. Do you do you function best when there are a bunch of different things that you're working on concurrently? No, I, I <laughs> no, I'm a terrible multitasker in all ways. You can ask my fiance. Um, I I obviously am very you know, this career path is incredibly uncertain. So it's really nice to have a stretch out in front of you where you know what is going to be happening. But in terms of creatively, I've always preferred to, and I've generally been able to really, in terms of a day to day, just invest in one thing at a time. So when I was doing parade, I was only doing parade. And when I tour, obviously, I only tour. And when I'm, I'm about to do this residency at the palace, and right now I'm all purely preparing for that. So I, I think I've not necessarily found that I'm a person who can extend myself to multiple things, especially because so many of them require me to be physically present. So I think uh, I, I much prefer to squeeze something for everything it's worth and get everything out of it that I can, as opposed to having hands in different pots at the same time. But it's great to have a little bit of purview and some some advanced idea of what might be coming down the pike or what I could be starting to you know ideate about, as opposed to necessarily going hard on two things at the same time. You mentioned this idea of the uncertainty of your profession, and it it it's kind of like hints at this idea of the anxiety, right? That we all feel. I mean, I'm I'm almost fifty, and I've been in this profession for a long time, and and can confidently say, you know, I've got a future. But there's always that anxiety, right? In any kind of profession that you have, and I wonder whether that anxiety is also a fuel 
but it also kind of – because there is uncertainty. I mean anybody looking at you can say, Ben Platt, he doesn't have anything to worry about. He's got, he's got an amazing career ahead of him, even if you sometimes don't feel mm-hmm. that way. But I wonder if that energy and that anxiety is also a fuel that you kind of need to have. Yeah, I think it's sort of a, a a thin line between that and like ambition. Like I think the idea that I want to continue to like achieve or accomplish or make things or try new things that scare me and I haven't done before is certainly a drive. I think that there's a danger in the you know giving into the anxiety of working for the sake of working. Like I think you know obviously I'm in a privileged position where I have a career where I, I, to a certain extent, can try to prioritize things that I'm passionate about and that creatively fulfill me. So even if that sometimes isn't necessarily the right quote unquote career move or or like professional move or what my you know representation or industry might suggest or hope that I'd be trying to do, I've found that the only way to keep that anxiety at bay is to, is to go after those things because the other stuff is so fleeting and ephemeral and like has all, usually nothing to do with whether you're the right or most qualified person to do it. It's just so dependent on so many other factors and, you know, it just industry things. And so I, I think it can be useful, but but it's definitely a slippery slope in terms of you have to learn how to just get comfortable with the difference in periods. There can be whole months at a time where everything is incredibly amorphous and there's nothing concrete. And then all of a sudden there's four concrete things and you're choosing between them. And it, it it's... um it's definitely the biggest challenge in terms of the personality I have and the life I've chosen because I love steadiness and routine. And part of the reason I love theater is because it's so unbelievably, I mean, other than obviously you never know when something's going to close, et cetera. But in terms of the doing of it daily, it's so ritualistic and repetitive. And yeah. I love that being able to expect something and get comfortable. And I crave that a lot, which unfortunately just is not usually the case. Tell me how you find the creative energy, where do you find that? Like on this record, Honey Mind, right? Where do you, what, what, like what's your, do you have a discipline? Do you sit down and say, I'm going to write a thousand words and not it's a, for a novel, but do you have a discipline where you're like, I have to write something even if it sucks, even if I'm going to throw it away? Yes. I mean, the nice thing about making the album is that I have the the added discipline of of, of co-writing. I, I almost always co-write. So there are, you know, if I have ideas for songs or things I want to work on on my own piano in my own house, I'll I'll start things and occasionally write things alone. But generally I have a very particular period of time where I'll go to Nashville or to New York or, you know, wherever I'm, my collaborators are and spend a few weeks with very, uh, you know, premeditated sessions and plans on the books so that no matter what, I'm forced to get in the room and try something and throw something at the wall. And you try to come in with, either seeds of something or concepts or a bit of some lyrics, sometimes a, a series of chords that I feel good about. It, it, it's quite elusive what, what it is, but I think embracing the kind of like vulnerability of like getting to know somebody and trying to write something real with them and sharing yourself with them immediately is just a great practice. And, you know, for every 10 songs that I write that I don't ever want to see the light of day, one comes out that makes me feel really excited and satisfied. And it generally you know, in terms of the creative energy, it certainly in this album's case comes a lot from my relationship and my, you know, my love for Noah and, you know, re- discovering and exploring what it feels like to be in, in a sort of adult long-term, like, um, settled relationship and like the ways in which that's what I thought it would be and the ways in which it's not. And that was a really fruitful area for me to explore in terms of like inspiring me to want to write about it. Tell me a little bit. I mean, you're so you've got so much experience, and you're still so young. I mean, you're at an age where many, many actors are just starting to break out, right? And so, you've you know you've produced and written your own TV show. You wrote a you wrote a film theater camp co wrote um, albums. Obviously, acting. Um, I know that you're involved in. I think you're involved in this Richard Linklater twenty year film project, which is uh, <laughs> merrily we roll along. Amazing. I mean, I hope, I, I mean, I hope everybody's around for 20 Touch years wood. to keep that going. <laughs> yeah. Um, what do you, I mean, when you, if you could kind of architect the next 10 years of your career, what do you think some of the things you might want to do? What are some of the things you might want to do? I, 
It's a good question. I, I, I'd really like to write a musical for sure at some point. I, that's always been on my bucket list. I, I'm trying not to rush into it in the sense that I... I think you could do that. <laughs> I think you might be able to hack that I one. I think it would be a good amalgam of some of the stuff I've done. But I, I, I haven't been inspired yet with the right story, whether that's original or an adaptation or whatever it is. So I'm trying to let the universe, you know, show me that when it's time. So I'm not trying to rush that. But certainly that's on the bucket list. Um, I'd love to do some f- more film with with some great filmmakers. I've, I've, I've been lucky to be in some wonderful films, but there's a lot of filmmakers that I admire that I would love the chance to work with. And I'd love to be in films of, of different textures. I, I, I've done a lot of film and television that has a certain heightened quality, whether that's because it's a musical or because it's like The Politician, which is super snarky yeah. and, and heightened and sharp. And I would love to do some some work on camera that exists in a much more grounded universe and play, play maybe like a little closer to my own energy um, would be really fun. Uh, I'd love to continue to make things with Noah. We, we had the opportunity to make theater camp together and we really loved the experience and we are looking to write uh, and create more stuff together. Um, love to keep making music and performing. I'd love to uh, definitely want to play George and Sunday in the Park with George before I die. That's a big one. Mm-hmm. Um, and eventually I would love to teach in some way. I mean, I the, the mm-hmm. other place where I feel the most joy besides performing myself is like in the theater camp space or in like a youth program or putting, you know, I've had the chance to be a counselor at a theater camp when I was a teenager. And I just, it was like the most wonderful transcendent thing ever just, and then getting to sort of simulate that in, in the film, it was like a reminder of how much I love getting to work with kids and particularly in the theater. So would love for that to happen someday. And uh, that's, that feels like a good list for the next few years. <laughs> When you feel stuck, right? Mm-hmm. When you feel, and we all do, right? We all go through periods where we're just stuck or we're just not feeling creative. And and it passes. Oftentimes it just passes. But but sometimes we can kind of will it out. I don't know. Is there Are there things you do or places you go or conversations you have or books you read or anything you do to kind of jumpstart that energy? So I try, I see a lot of theater in, in those moments. I think whether I am trying to get inspired particularly to do theater or not, it's just a great way of shaking up. You go, you go to a lot of theater just to, just cause as, as a fan of theater, I, not surprisingly. I'm obsessed with, yes, I go to as many things as I possibly can at any time, but particularly at a, at a moment where I'm feeling like stuck or like I need to shake things up or feel inspired. It's a great place to go. Um, or just see live music to see other people perform. Um, I watch films or, you know, either things I love that I want to revisit or, or get some recommendations for new things and try to you know, experience some new ideas. I um, talk to Noah. I mean, I think Noah's a really inspirational, creative person and has a lot of amazing ideas and bouncing things off of him is, is such a gift of our relationship and vice versa. And, um, and I try, the main thing is just trying not to panic, like, which is not my nature. I, my, my nature is to definitely and immediately panic. And I think <laughs> like <laughs> I try really hard to lean back and, I'll, you know, t- t- remind myself that I've been in this spot before and something has presented itself or I've gotten inspired or the right thing has come along or, you know, I've, I, I, an I- idea has arisen and that it sometimes takes a minute and the universe needs to take a beat and, and and have it come to you when it's supposed to. And, I, you know, I have to sometimes fight against my nature to be like overly proactive because as artists, like we can be proactive to a certain extent, but it is this really elusive, like thing that can't be which is sort of a theme that's emerging, like muscled through. So I think, yeah, I think l- allowing things to, to come through and, and just leaning back and, and taking some downtime, which is easier said than done is, um, is helpful. Ben Platt. Thanks so much. Thank you. Thanks for having me. That's actor and singer Ben Platt. His new album is called Honey Mind, and Ben is touring that record and also doing a residency at the Palace Theater on Broadway. You can find a link to the album and some videos of Ben's performances at the show notes. Just go to thegreatcreators.com slash Platt. And if you want to see more conversations like this one, please click the subscribe button so you never miss a new episode of the show. And of course, if you want to listen to The Great Creators, just look for it wherever you listen to podcasts. Just search for The Great Creators. I'm Guy Raz, and you've been watching the great creators from Built It Productions. We'll be back next week with another new episode. See you then.